this um, makes me incredibly happy. I wrote this book with the idea of being able then to speak to activists on the ground, to people who actually like put energy uh, in their lives to try to change the world. And in fact, it is dedicated to revolutionaries everywhere, past, present, and future, especially to my, my great uncle who actually um, committed suicide in prison because he was uh, tortured by the fascist militia um, during the Nazi fascist occupation of Italy uh, in the Second World War. And um, as like him, he believed in, you know, fighting for a better future. And I think we are all here with the idea that it doesn't make sense to give up. And um, my contribution has been to propose a framework of understanding what is happening, which is, I think, more thorough in grasping how capitalism is about class warfare and how capitalism is about winners and losers and how there is no harmony uh, in, in the economic relations in, in our socioeconomic system. So in this sense, uh, the idea here that austerity is not an exception. It's not something that we can um, restrict to certain policies that happen with the neoliberal epoch, from the 1980s onwards, this wave of austerity as something that is the exception to the norm. The theory of the capital order, the book I just published, is actually that austerity is in the DNA our very, of our very economic system. And austerity, and we need to now, we will take a minute to also redefine austerity because that is actually very important. But the thesis here is that austerity is in the DNA of our economic system and that it cannot be reduced to bad economic theory, which leads to bad economic policy. This is an understanding which is typical of uh, many left-wing movements, many people who consider themselves progressives, who have, though, unfortunately, internalized the dominant rhetoric, which ultimately depoliticizes austerity and sees austerity just as a technical tool to manage this that this like object which is the economic machine which is ultimately not at all about exploitation but more about how can we all achieve growth and progress yes so the idea here is that if you take this view of austerity as a tool then the only way you can understand what goes on right now is to say, well, this is pure madness. Why are we repeating a policy that has not worked on its own terms, right? It's full of studies, and Toko was kind enough to actually share many with me also produced here in, in South Africa. It's full of studies who, mm -hmm. which show that austerity has not increased growth, has not uh, uh, helped to pay back the debt, actually has worsened the debt trap, has not produced employment. So um, it has failed in its own rhetoric. So the only way you can understand then what is happening if you have a depoliticized view of austerity is to say, well, it must be corruption. It must be like, you know, just like pure irrationality ultimately, right? And I don't think, which is, and this is the typical vision of, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but with like Keynesian economist or, you know, Economists on the left of the spectrum who don't, though, thoroughly problematize what is more fundamental, which is capitalism, yes? So the idea here is to give a different story, to say it's not enough to just reduce what is happening to mere rationality or corruption, because that's not really satisfactory. Um, what we need to realize is that austerity is not stupid is very intelligent and it is intelligent because it works structurally to disempower the people to shift resources away from the many who live off of wages and state uh, benefits to the few very few who earn make a living from capital and rent from profits yes and interest okay so 
this is the idea that austerity is actually a very intelligent political project that serves fundamentally to kill our economic agency, kill the agency of the people, foreclose alternatives to capitalism, keep us all thinking that this is the only society possible. And this is done both through theory. So we will talk a little bit about the role of economists in telling us that there is nothing else outside of capitalism because this is the best and only possible world. But it's also done materially by ultimately making us all precarious, making us all depend on the market, right? It increases market dependence. Market dependence is something that is very specific of capitalism, but it's a very recent phenomenon, right? It's only really around 300, 400 years ago that in the United Kingdom, the birthplace of capitalism, with the enclosures, with the privatization of the commons, people became dependent on the market, meaning that they did not anymore have means to subsist on their own. Before they cultivated land, they had uh, resources that were common, right? the common, right? So they could take water, they could build their shelters. They were self-sufficient and this is why in feudal Europe, for example, okay, where capitalism emerged, uh, the Lord had to extract the surplus from the serf politically because people were independent economically, right? They were self-sufficient. The way to extract resources was to tell the serf, if you don't give me some of the things you produce, we are going to punish you by law and physically punish you, right? So the coercion was explicit, was political. Now, what happens with the birthplace of capitalism, with the birth of capitalism and the birthplace being England, right? Um, things change. The majority loses the connection to the resources, the connection to the land. Thus, we become market dependent, which means simply that to survive, to pay rent, to buy food, to go to school, we gotta have money in our pockets because without money, we don't do anything. Now, this is something we take for granted. I tell my students, this is something we don't even think about because this is how we're used to living, right? But it's actually very peculiar to capitalism and it's a very young economic system. It's very little time that people have lived like this. And in this country, even le less time, right? But the point is that with capitalism, given that we are dependent on money for our survival, exploitation happens impersonally. There is no one who tells you to go to work, right? There's no one actually coming and forcing you to go get a job. But you know that if you don't get a job, you're not gonna make it, right? This is called impersonal coercion. And it's very different from what happened in the past, you know, slave society and slave societies, people were coerced to work and it was political coercion. The exploitation was explicit, right? We're, here it's slightly different. It's implicit, it's hidden, but it's still there. Because if you don't go and sell your labor, your capacity to work for a wage, you won't live. And this selling your capacity to, to work is at the root of economic growth. Capital accumulation, economic growth under capitalism, all depends on capital. This is the title of the book, The Capital Order, sorry. <laughs> Wait, I made a mess. The, the capital order means that capital as wealth, as money, as the riches, as what we are proud about, about our society being such a society that GDP grows, right? You know what, this is a society where GDP grows so much. Well, this wealth, capital as a thing, as a commodity, as money, is founded upon capital as a social relation. It depends on the social relation by which the majority of us have no other option but to go and work for a wage, which means that you are exploited because you will be producing more value than what you are paid for. Surplus, the foundation of wealth, of capital, depends on us basically being trapped in this condition of low-paid wage workers, okay? 
And again, this is not something that has happened forever. It's very specific. Capitalism has been on this earth for 0.1% of the time Homo sapiens has been on this planet. Think about it, it's nothing. But austerity is so powerful that we are all convinced that this is eternal, forever, has always been, and there's no way out. And actually probably that it's for the best because we are ultimately in the most advanced society of all. Mm -hmm. But it's a society based on violence, on economic violence of an impersonal type, yes? So in this framework, we understand that austerity is fundamental to capitalism. Why? Because it protects capital as the social relation of, that is foundational to our society, okay? So austerity acts as a protector. So you see that the thing that austerity is irrational doesn't make sense because austerity is actually very important for our system because it preserves the precariousness of us all so that we really have no means to think there are alternatives out there. And I will explain more, but this is just more of a general understanding, okay? So now that I said this, austerity as fundamental to our system because it preserves capital as the social relation, we need to understand what austerity is, yes? And also here, it is very important to rethink what we mean by austerity. Because unfortunately, austerity has been so successful in its capacity to rule our minds that we have ultimately all internalized the definitions of those in power. So even the critics, even the militants, even the people on the left have to break away, I feel, from concepts that we have taken in without really thoroughly trying to critique them and ultimately break them apart. Austerity is a typical example, and I explain why now. What do you guys mean by austerity? What's the definition that you guys understand by austerity? There are some ideas. When you say austerity, what does it mean? <laughs> That's a good definition. You brought it up. Yes, I'm the, yeah. Yes, exactly. Would you guys agree with the definition? Right. So usually we restrict the, the concept to reduction of uh, expenditures, yes? Now, what I would like to, to, what the capital order claims is that austerity is much more. We have to think about austerity as a trinity, as a combination of a set of policies that all help reinforce one another. So we have fiscal austerity. I'm just going to name them and then just explain. Monetary austerity and industrial austerity. And you cannot think of one without another. And I'll explain why in a second. What do we mean by fiscal austerity? Because this is usually what people focus on when they talk about austerity. Fiscal austerity usually, uh, if you read even uh, the, all the wonderful documents I received from Toko, they say, well, austerity is about reducing expenditures and increases tax, increasing taxes, period. Now you see that this type of definition looks at the aggregate, which is typical of economists, by the way. Economists only look at the aggregate because they dropped class analysis a long time ago, okay? So by looking at the aggregate, what happens is that you lose what austerity is all about. So it's not about cutting expenditures only. It's about where the state decides to cut. So if the state is paying a lot on debt servicing, paying back the interest on debt. If the debt is spending a lot on the military, what they're doing now, for example, in Italy, because we're financing NATO, right? If the state spends ultimately on the money few, this doesn't mean there's no austerity. And you see, you cannot see this if you look at the aggregates. 
And Doc was just telling me now that even in the budget to right now in, in South Africa, 2023, the claim is there's no austerity. Look at how much we're spending. The point is, let's go look where they're spending. And what you find out is actually that also in this country, they, they're spending 300 billion rands, 300,000 billion, 300 billion rands, sorry, 300 billion rand on debt servicing. And they're spending far fewer on health, on education, on public development, which includes, by the way, water and, and electricity. So you see that the resources are not for the people, right? They go in the hands of the creditors, who, by the way, mostly are international financial institutions, right? So are the money few, the global elite? So this is, for me, very important. That when we talk about fiscal austerity, we would go look at where the state spends. And what you find out is that the state historically cuts public benefits of all sorts. What you introduced the conversation with. And this and, and gives and uses the resources to pay back the debt, which means again that the money is taken away from the majority of the working people to a very few minority of the people with this money that does make more money out of the money they have because they lend it, right? Now, this is not a mistake, again, because if you take away healthcare, if you make education private, right? You take away resources so people ultimately have to revert to the private sector. The more you take away from the welfare of the people, the more the people become precarious, more market dependent, right? Because you need more money in your pocket if, this, if you're not given certain rights. You're going to have to pay for them. And, in this, and this is, in fact, the logic of austerity because you want to tame the general public to be more, um, what's the word, um, docile politically docile because they're trapped in economic precariousness, right? So this is fiscal austerity. One side of it, where the money, where the state spends, away from the people. Then we have the other side of fiscal austerity, which where does the money come from? The revenue side, right? Because fiscal policy is about how much it spend, the state spends, but also where the state takes the money. Right? And guess what? You can't just talk about tax hikes or tax cuts in general. Again, you need to see who is being taxed. And what you find out is that austerity is about regressive taxation. And when we talk about regressive taxation, what you mean is that the majority is bearing the brunt of taxation much more than the moneyed minority. So what happens is that the state increases consumption taxes, okay? The VAT in this country mm. went up, um, I had it down, went up now to 15%, right? Now it's 15%. While the state cuts corporate taxes, tax, it cuts the taxes on inheritance, tax all, cuts all taxes on wealth fundamentally, right? Now corporate taxation was 50% in the 1990s is in this country and now it's down to 28 percent if i don't recall yeah. wrongly yeah. so you see regressive taxation is all about taking money away from the people and again preserving the money in the pockets of the few so what's paradoxical is this few who are not taxed then are also making money because they are lending money to the state. So not only they're not taxed and they're not contributing to the revenue of the state, they're also those who gain from lending and so from the interest that the, date, the state is spending, right? So you see how it's a constant shift of resources to these few. Great. So this is fiscal austerity. 
Then we have monetary austerity. Monetary austerity, guess what? Is what we're seeing since a year from now, what we've been seeing is that interest rates have been going up. Central banks around the globe have been increasing interest rates like crazy. And this is true also in South Africa. So again, when you increase interest rates and the Fed now is all crazy, what you see is what you, when you increase the interest rates, again, it's not a stupid policy. It's very intelligent if you understand the logic of capitalism. When you increase the interest rates, what happens? The working people have a harder time getting at the end of the month, right? Especially if you're indebted because you need more money than what you earn in order to make it at the end of the month, right? So for household, it becomes more difficult to take on loans. But what's most important is that increases in interest rates induce recessions. It becomes more expensive to borrow also for businesses. And this ultimately leads to more layoffs, less people getting hired, unemployment. And guess what? Unemployment is a fundamental disciplinary mechanism under capitalism. What Marx called the reserve army of labor is something that also Fed officials like, like Janet Yellen understand very clearly as being fundamental to discipline people in accepting lower wages. Why? Well, because if you have competitors out there and you risk losing your job, this is something all of us know, you will be silent and will accept lower wages. And this is exactly what capitalism needs, needs to have lower wages. So I'm saying Janet Yellen because there's a very uh, interesting document that was disclosed of 1996 in which she, uh, Janet Yellen was at the time at the, uh, now she's at the treasury, a uh, secretary of the treasury in the United States. Uh, she's an economist and she's considered a very progressive economist. And she was writing in the nineties uh, to uh, Alan Greenspan at the time head of the chair. And she was just really saying, we can only keep interest rates low if, Workers are um, weak. If workers are weak, we can keep uh, in interest rates low. If workers get strong because unions get strong and because there's high employment, we need to keep interest rates up because this will keep the disciplinary mechanism of unemployment alive. Okay, And this is exactly what in the United States is going on. In the United States, people right now are unionizing more. People right now are getting higher nominal wages because we are in a moment in which the labor market is tight, meaning that there's more job openings than people willing to go work. Okay. And this is a huge problem for capitalism. There's people giving up. 46 million American workers in 2022 gave up um, on their jobs. They're like, you know what? We're sick and tired. This is disgusting, exploitative. We're done. It's the, called the great resignation. And what you see is that when people decide to stop working, start unionizing, this is a capital disorder that needs to be ordered, okay? This is a moment in which in, people at the Fed, the experts at the Fed say, no, 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 we're sorry. This is, the labor market is problematic right now. Let's fix it. Let's fix it with a good dosage of, of monetary austerity, we increase the interest rates, people will suffer from unemployment and will go back to their jobs accepting a low wage because they are market dependent. Once more, austerity, intelligent project to keep us all under a capital order. Finally, we had industrial austerity, which is usually not thought about, but it's very important because industrial austerity goes directly Industrial austerity goes directly to disciplined workers. How? Privatizing, big important role privatization, because all economists know that people who work for the public sector are more entitled. So that's no good. Okay. <laughs> so you need to uh, privatize. And this is, of course, something that is a huge battle in Italy right now. Uh, 
Mario Draghi, supposedly a great Keynesian economist, just uh, privatized water after basically we had a referendum around 10 years ago, which in which people explicitly went to vote against privatization of utilities and water. And now we have it again privatized and they passed it without noticing. Same is happening here. Um, they're advocating for privatization of electricity, of utilities, of water, et cetera. Great. And then it's again, attacks on labor unions, wage repression, deregulation of labor, very important deregulation. Let's make work more flexible. Okay. This is industrial austerity. So it took me a while, but I think it's very important to think about austerity as this trinity. Because this whole trinity shows you how the project is, again, to shift resources away from the people, extract resources from the majority in favor of a minority. And this is, again, very important to protect the idea that there's no way out of the system. And when they tell us that they're cutting expenditures because they're worried about the budget, this is clearly all talking points with a much more deeper goal, which is again found in the labor relations, found in the fact that they need to stabilize class, the class system. So I wrote a couple of op-eds um, on The Guardian to say, you know, and this is kind of the ultimate theoretical result of this historical study that I will tell you a little bit about in a second, which is there is a short term cost for the ruling elite, which is uh, destabilizing the economy. Economists know they are inducing a recession and they say it, right? There is a cost, which is a short term recession for a much more structural gain, which is that of stabilizing class relations, okay? So you destabilize the economy momentarily in order to guarantee the capital order in the wrong, long run, in order to ultimately guarantee that the basis for economic growth, again, capital is a social relation by which people do accept to go to work for a low wage, is my argument. yes? And this, by the way, is not me radical Marxist economist saying it. You just hear what the people at the Fed, the American Central Bank are saying, and potentials of people in, in this central bank in this country, they're very explicit. You know, yes, we know we're inducing a recession, but that's fine because ultimately we need to get back to the fundamentals, which is ultimately low wages, which is the basis of a smooth, healthy capitalist economy. All this is to say that our society is not not meant for the good of the whole. There's winners and there's losers. And austerity helps pre preserves the social reality. Now, this is not a natural fact. And what I would like to say now, given that I already spoke 30 minutes, so I'm going to only speak like 10 more. And then I, I have a lot to say, so we can continue. But maybe it's nice to make it more interactive. As you saw, I have a lot to say. <laughs> I didn't even get to the story yet, but it's okay. Okay, let me take a drink and then. I always feel bad for my students because they have, they have to listen to it. The worst are the my research, my teaching assistants, yeah. <laughs> who since they're very poor in New York, they have to take the job, <laughs> and then they have to come listen to me speak for two hours a, a week, and they're they're like dead at the end. They're like this is torture. <laughs> okay, so anyway, okay, so. I talked at a more general level, uh, telling you a little bit about what's happening right now. But what I'm saying is the outcome of almost 10 years of research, which is of a historical type, okay? Um, I'm a weird economist in the sense that I take history seriously, which is not usually what economists do. And I did a lot of research in the archives um, to show through a historical case study what I just tried to express at a more general level right now, okay? So I look at what happened exactly a hundred years ago. And it's a really important moment because it's a moment in which austerity becomes visible as a political project, 
okay? Why does it become visible? Well, because even if it was there before, before it was kind of the norm, okay? We had laissez-faire capitalism. Of course, there was austerity in the colonies always. That was just what happened always. But in 1919, things were a bit different in Europe. Western Europe, and we just had a Russian revolution a couple of years before. In Western Europe, capitalism was an existential crisis. It was not just an economic downturn. It was not just a moment in which you say, oh, there's, you know, there's the, the GDP is low. That happened after. The, everyone focuses on 1929, right, usually. Because that's the moment that is not threatening for the system anymore, because unemployment is already very high in 1929. In 1919, there is literally an existential crisis, the biggest existential crisis of our economic system as it is today. Why? Because with the First World War, this, I mean, I'm not going to say much because I hope you guys have a chance to, um, to take a look at the book because I, I tell the story in detail. Fundamentally, the bottom line is that with the Great War, the First World War, a major, major shock in the economy. The state has to intervene for the first time to produce directly, becomes the major employer, um, the major producer. This repoliticizes or politicizes, let's say for the first time, the pillars of capitalism. And what are these pillars? Wage relations, of course, what we just discussed, and private property of the means of production. In 1919, when the war was over, it was clear for the people that these were not natural facts, but they were explicit political choices of the state to maintain society based on wage relations and private property of the means of production. And people were extremely critical of the status quo. And the war has shown how there are a lot of possibilities that were possible. For example, the state all of a sudden could spend a ton of money producing arms. Well, they had said until before the war that there was no way out of the gold standard. There was no way out uh, of paying more than what they already did. Actually, the war showed that there was a lot of fiscal resources available if only the political will was there, right? So it's here in 1919, 1920, and the first part of the capital order is all about this, that all of these alternative ways of organizing society emerge. Alternative ways of organizing production and distribution of resources. How? Well, I show a full spectrum. There's more reformist, more radical. It, but to give you an example, the council movement was extremely strong in those years. So the council movement, and again, in the Eastern Europe, we were having the Soviets, the real revolution happening. In the West, though, these events were also happening, even if no one wants to tell this story because it's dangerous for the status quo. So people literally, I'm, I think, I mean, there's very, there's a lot of very obscure literature that gets into the cases, but it's the first time that like a book tries to set all of these varieties of alternatives all down at once very explicitly, because again, historians also are very political. They don't want to say, tell stories that can get people radicalized, right? Intellectuals, academics, they have a big role in preserving our ignorance about possible way outs. Okay, that's very important. So, anyway, just to give you one example out of the many that I talk about in the book, the council movement was all about worker self management. What is about horizontal relations in production, assemblies in which people took back ownership of their work? of their activity and of the output. And this happened democratically. So this is a moment in Italy very important. Maybe some of you know about Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci is, you know, has become, and then he has also been used in ways to make him less threatening through the cultural turn, whatever. But the point is that Antonio Gramsci himself, the reason why he comes out with all of these incredible, intelligent, methodological breakthroughs which debunk bourgeois ideology, such as the concept of praxis, the concept of worker agency, the concept of actual, the connection between the economic and the political, and the impossibility of thinking about political democracy if it's not based on economic democracy. You cannot have it hollow to speak about democracy just because we go to the elections 
and we vote once a year. These guys with the worker council movement in 1919, 1920 in Italy were seeing all of this and were putting in practice these councils which were working. They took over all of the factories for an entire summer and were running them independently, showing that it's actually the work that is the source of value, the worker and not the entrepreneur. Um, I just want to read you this passage because I think it's actually very important. There's a section of the book called Against the Political and Economic Divide. And I think I just read this because I think it's important for us today still. The Italian philosopher and academic Zino Zini gave the inaugural lecture of the newly founded Turn School of Socialist Culture, a speech titled From Citizen to Producer. This was a school for workers, right? So the idea was that education was crucial to empower the people. In February 1920, he argued that the citizen, as typically understood in bourgeois democracy, is an abstract individual, one who is sovereign in theory, quote, when in fact, he's only such on the day of elections. All the rest of his time, he is nothing but a subordinate to laws and rules drafted outside of his contribution. The economic laws, the impersonal economic laws, which we have no say on. An individual's political servitude is founded upon economic servitude. The inequality of economic conditions, or better, the inequality of the positions within the relations of production impedes any genuinely democratic relations among free and equal human beings. On the other hand, Zini wrote, the post-capitalist society will give rise to a new man, the conscious producer who exercises at once economic and political freedom. It will be the new society of free and equal producers. Okay, so really, really emancipatory conception of how we could rethink the foundation of our very economic order, okay? So it goes without saying that the first part of the book is the one I'm most excited about mm -hmm. because of all of these alternatives that I think can still give us some insight today, okay? So alternatives that speak, alternatives that were happening a hundred years ago, but can really speak to us now when people say, okay, so then what do we do? You know, everyone's like, oh no, what do we do? Well, what do we do? We, we like take people seriously in their capacity to self-organize in the basic needs to run society. This is what we do. And this is what was happening in that time. By the way, also in Britain, the most conservative of all societies, the guild socialists were actually much more efficient than the private businesses in running and building houses in 1920. Then of course, austerity kicked in and we, we got back to the idea that there was no way out. So the second part of the book, three more minutes and then I'm done. The second part of the book is all about the reaction, the emergence of austerity as a political project to foreclose all of these alternatives as a counteroffensive that came from the experts in power, okay? So the ruling elites, and this, I focus a lot on the role of economic experts and the type of economic theories that govern us still today and how they really serve to close our political imagination, to capture our idea that we, we're just, we just have to be passively accepting what we see around us. So the second part of the book is all the story about how austerity is thought about codified in these first international financial conferences, this new financial code that then is implemented all through Europe. And in just a couple of years, all of these great alternatives to capitalism were completely killed. How? Well, in Britain, thanks to the surge of unemployment, the Bank of England raised interest rates in 1920 and in a couple of years, unemployment rate was up 17%. Strikes were defeated. I show data in chapter 10, actually quite clearly. Strikes go down. And in a minute, the wage share goes down. So how much of the GDP goes to wages instead of profits? Falls once more. It had risen during the years of revolution. It falls once more. And of course, the profit rates start going up. 
So the, the capital order is secured. And with the securing of the capital order, so the fact that if people are not complaining anymore about their position of, as wage workers, comes securing of greater profits. Okay, so I talk about the story of Britain and how the Trinity, the austerity Trinity operates in a very explicit classist way, right? One-sided class warfare of the experts against the people. And then I show how this is happening also under fascist Italy. And what is interesting, I think, are two insights that I would like to end with. One is, the parallelism between the fascist case and the liberal case. What we see today is that austerity cuts across party lines, right? To the point that the, here, right, it's the ANC that also supports austerity. Mm -hmm. Well, what you see historically is that if you take austerity as a way to understand capitalism, then the usual dichotomies that we have in our minds fall, like the big distinction between fascism and liberalism. If you look at what was happening in the 1920s, you see that economists supported Benito Mussolini, the first fascist dictator, because of his capacity to be so efficient in implementing austerity. Mussolini privatized the greatest privatization campaign in Western capitalism was done by Mussolini in the 1920s. He, yes, the Duce, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini. And now we know we have a lot of fascists still now. Um, um, privatized, he laid off public employees. He cut the social expenditures. He increased interest rates. He did the whole trinity, okay? And if you read chapter eight of the book, I show how the whole liberal elite of the world, British, the Times, the Economist, all the fancy journals that are considered, you know, the, the well-meaning all about freedom of speech and liberal values, they were the biggest fans of Mussolini and they were writing it explicitly. They were saying, you know, Italian people are turbulent. What do you want? This is the only way out, right? They say it, I mean, I have so many quotes. Um, there's Montagu Norman, he was the head of the Bank of England in the 20s. So really like the emblem of liberalism. He was writing, this is a letter I found in the archives of the Bank of England. He was writing to the guy of JP Morgan Chase, uh, JP Morgan Chase, currently a bank, first supporters of Mussolini, mm -hmm. was saying, fascism has surely brought order out of chaos over the last few years. Something of the kind was no doubt needed if the pendulum was not to swing too far in quite the other direction. The Duce was the right man at a critical moment. And everyone's saying, look, the strikes are down, industrial peace is again, uh, sta you know, we stabilize class relations. Again, there's a cost, which is the fact that Mussolini is torturing, killing, and, 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 and massacring any public political opposition, and these guys know it because Montagu Norman was complaining about how, you know, there's no freedom of speech anymore. But ultimately what matters is the economic order, the capital order, okay? So the, the case study that I propose really shows how with austerity as our focus, liberalism, fascism, it's all about repressing the workers and repressing wages and keeping us all vulnerable in accepting the society as it is. This is one insight. And I show, of course, last chapter shows how this is true throughout the history of capitalism. There's so many other examples, the example of Pinochet in Chile, the, even the example of uh, someone like uh, Yeltsin in Russia when, when the Soviet Union falls. Everyone is supporting this guy who bombed parliament. He bombed his own parliament, okay? And everyone, and, and again, the economist is like, yeah, someone like Larry Summers, again, considered a progressive economist, he was saying in the 90s, you know, that's fine. So long as they privatize and they open to the market reforms, uh, that's the best we can do. We need a strong man to do this because the people don't want it. So you need a strong man. So the clear necessity of anti-democratic measures, okay? Austerity is anti-democratic. So this is a first important connection between repressive politics, anti-democracy and austerity. And this is the other insight that comes out of the book is the importance of shielding economic decisions 
and economic power from the people. Mm. So you can do it in many different ways. You can do it with a dictator, but you can also do it with the independent central bank. Okay. Again, we are used to independent central banks as something that is obvious for us, right? Of course, the base central bank is independent, of course. Well, guess what? Again, this is not something natural. It was fought for and fought for from the elites. It was built in the 1920s and exported all over the world in Britain. So they, the Bank of England, which by the way, was a private corporation, right? And then they wanted, the Labour Party wanted to nationalize it in the 1920s. And these guys really said, no, no, Keynes himself was one of the biggest advocates for the fact that experts should be in power, not the people. So at that point, they exported to India, to South Africa, to, to, uh, to, to Brazil, everywhere else in the world, okay? They export the institution of the independent central bank as an, why? Because they know that no one, and they say it, they say it to this day, only an independent central bank is inflation averse. Okay, they use technical language to tell you only central banks which are independent are willing to have the people sacrifice for economic stabilities through increases in interest rates. Okay, the virtuous economic policy can only come from the elites who don't care about the people because they're not even voted in for, right? These people are not liable to elections. They're not even liable to getting kicked out of office. They're not kicked out. They're just there, okay? So this important point, and then of course the role, and we can expand more later because now I talk too much about the economic models. As an economist, I did a lot of work in the history of economic thought to show you that the type of economics that you study at school, when your kids or yourselves go to school and study microeconomics, macroeconomics, when you think you're studying a neutral science, guess what? It's the most political of subjects at all. Because you know what? The most political powerful weapon is what weapon? The one who denies being political, right? They deny being political and this is so powerful because that's how you become even more supposedly persuasive. This is not politics, it's an economic necessity. We gotta do cuts because that's how we get efficient. Of course, it's the economist who tells you and everyone else is like, oh, I'm too ignorant. I don't understand what's going on all these technical stuff, we better leave it to the expert. Well, this is the trick. You leave it to the expert and they do the interest of the capital order, which again is the interest of preserving capitalism, which means that the people will suffer always. This is the type of society we are in, okay? So the models, the way the economists think about the world, the fact, for example, that they expel the worker from the model, right? There's no more labor theory of value. Now there's the entrepreneur who has the center. So the fact that you think everyone can become an entrepreneur, there's no classes in these models. Class conflict is gone. Economists nowadays don't think about class conflict. That was old style economics. Now it's all about harmony, about individuals, about the fact that if someone gets rich, the entrepreneur, he deserves it. And guess what? He will also do the good of everyone else. And we all kind of internalize these models, even without knowing they come from these models. A lot of us have these values because they do come from academia and they get dispersed through society. But these are ways, again, to close our political imagination, to really trap us in the idea that we are in a decent society and clearly we are not. And I will stop here for now, thank you. Uh, I can see covers already <laughs> eager to. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll field three questions right now, and of course it doesn't only have to be questions; it can also be inputs. So I'm just requesting that if it's an input, obviously comrades must not be too, you know, long-winded. Keep it concise. Keep it to the point. But of course, um, we'll field three questions, give the professor a chance to respond, and we'll take three more questions and we'll see where we go from there on. So we can just go one, two, three. Um, why, uh, uh, listen to you, why do you think that uh, the, 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 the left is uh, coming sexual? I'll tell you why. 
can create a base of masses of people who are poor, who are sick, who are depressed. To what extent can what they produced uh, be bought by a base of people who don't have buying power? Yeah. And how does this keep capitalism sustainable? And what extent will they come out and say we need a much plan? We need we need we need to raise things because it looks to me that things are falling up. Yes, thank you. This is great. Thanks. So thank we'll uh, I've noted other comments for the next three right. questions. That, that's first, can yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Um, <clears throat> really great questions. Okay, so. I think the first two um, comments both really give concrete examples of what it means for austerity to disempower at different levels, right? Because we have the level uh, of, of the activist um, on the ground feeling alone. Um, and this is something that clearly, again, is part of the fact that even common working people have internalized the common sense, which is deeply individualistic. Mm -hmm. And this individualism, um, which also I think is related to, we can go back to like the reasons why ultimately even the Marxist um, tradition has, has um, given up somehow. This individualism, again, I mean, there's many sources, right? And again, I think the point is that it makes sense in a society that is a capitalist society. In other societies, individualism wouldn't even really make sense uh, as a way of understanding the world, right? So again, how our ideas are definitely connected to the type of reality we live in, right? Um, but certainly it is pushed and um, made very powerful by also economists themselves, uh, uh, who again tell you that there's no classes, there's just individuals. Mm -hmm. And these individuals ultimately uh, should compete with one another. And this brings ultimately a more harmonic, efficient order. Um, while um, someone like Antonio Gramsci in 1919 was saying, no, we should stop thinking about, we should, individuals, but we should think about the producer, like a classless society, a genuinely classless society, which unfortunately, uh, since the hunter-gatherer society, we, we saw very little of, um, um, is, is the idea that we're all, we are all universal producers, right? So there is really no, no division amongst us, and there's no, of course, uh, subordination. Uh, between different groups and classes. But the point is that we are producers, which means that we can only produce collectively. You see how like the idea of the council was the idea of that it was the collective, the unit, the organizational unit of society wasn't the collective. Of course, the collective is, is, is not an easy um, uh, situation. It's much e easier to just say, I'll just do whatever I want, right? I don't need to care what others think. Of, like it's much more ambitious to actually build a society based on collectives because there's all sorts of problems that emerge. But the point is that you need humans, uh, and this is something again Gramsci said very well. There's no biological innate uh, aspect of our behavior, right? I see now I have a little boy. He could really grow up in any society if he would, you know, like the potential of actually um, educating ourselves to living in collectives in a way that they work. Right. So this again, we are convinced that no humans are egoistic. Why? Because the models, the economists tell you this is a given anthropological fact that the homo economicus is really who we are. The homo economicus is the rational economic agent who is deeply individualistic and egoistic. And this is like the foundation of society for economists, is egoistic agents. You see how this has an effect of, of convincing us, it's called performativity in the, in the fancy words. When, when we kind of like make it real by our own way of living, right? So I don't know if that can help, but the point is that I don't think it should be depressing. I hope this message here is not depressing, it's actually empowering. I'm here to try to give you tools to say, what we see around us that makes us angry, makes us feel defeated, makes us feel like we don't have enough, uh, political energy around us. This is all constructed actively by the ruling elite who are so terrified about the, this, this capitalist order breaking down that they do whatever it takes to keep it alive, okay? 
To the point that now, in a moment in which capitalism is already in deep crisis of overproduction of all sorts of crises, they're still willing to induce a recession just to make sure people stop asking for higher wages or start like thinking that maybe they shouldn't go to work at all. You know, they're willing to do whatever it takes to keep it alive. So I think this is very powerful: is to say, listen, your enemy, they don't take it for granted. The left takes it much more for granted than the people in power. So I think this is important. The potential. So this is, uh, I, I, I went to the second question first. Um, the value of the rand. You see how that, that is also, of course, that is real. That's a real constraint. This is again how austerity is disempowering because it speaks the truth of capitalism. In a capitalist market economy, an open market economy, if your exchange rate is undervalued, you are screwed. And this is the reality. I mean, it's not like we can, you know, be all like uh, modern monetary theory. We don't need to give a shit. No, maybe modern monetary theory works for for the 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 the, the, the United States in specific occasions, whatever. But it's not. The point is that any economic problem is also deeply a political problem in our society. There's no technically possible, but politically and physical. Economic and politics and capitalism go together. And this is something that economists, of course, don't see, not even the progressive ones. And that's why they're weak. That's why they're weak, theoretically. That's why then they're just saying, oh, look, this this template, the world could be great. Just follow this template. This is all technically possible. Guess what? No, no one's willing to implement it. Well, then why? Why is no one willing to implement it? Well, guess what? Because economic problems are also deeply political problems. Um, so it's true. The value of the RAM is a problem, right? And so, no, I'm in, in an open market capitalist economy, you can't flood the, 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 the market with money, especially if you're a country in the periphery of the world, because you're going to be stuck in it. The, they're going to hate you, the international uh, debtors in the market, right? You're literally going to, like, the population is just going to die of starvation. It's happening in Sri Lanka right now. The, the currency is so devalued, people are literally dying of starvation. And we know we live in a world in which no one gives a fuck if people die of starvation. In Afghanistan, there are a million people dying of starvation. There's the worst humanitarian crisis, induced, of course, by wars and you know, whatever, the United States. And so the reality is that no one cares if people die of starvation. What people, the people at the power care about is preserving the capital order. Yeah? So this is what I'm saying, is that it, it, if you're someone in power right now, the value of the rand is a problem. Because unless you break out, so this is the call, my call, and this is why the first part of the book is about post-capitalist alternatives, is that it's much more difficult to reform our system because of all these real limits of capitalism. It's real. That's why austerity is persuasive, because it's true that if you don't pay your debt, you're going to be even in further debt, and then they're going to come and, and let you starve if you have nothing. This is a reality. But again, it's a political construction coming out of collective decision making. There's nothing. It's not a tree. It's our society that is built that way. OK, so you can change it. So I think this is really important. It speaks to the power of austerity, but also to the fact that we got to know our enemies. We can't, we can't, we can't get trapped. We need to think of real alternatives way. And I think we are in a moment in which this is possible because the younger generation is really fed up. The climate disasters, the amount of uh, of uh, of migrants you will have for the ecological breakdown. Mm. It's going to be apocalypse, and either people decide let's let's get together and change the basis and just say maybe we don't need the rand at all anymore you know i mean the idea that we do need money as mediating our economy that's again a construction for the then this if you guys read marx i mean he speaks about you know the rule of the money form the money rules over us this is not something this is again constructed um and we could potentially break out of it how well there's you know different paths i'm not here to like <laughs> to prophesize on the back, but I think like just generally like getting together, discussing issues, realistically understanding what capitalism is about, that's the first step. And it's a very important step. Stop idealizing our system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um the um quite the very two very important remarks you made. Um one of the fact that uh, the the socialist party sold out absolutely um Gramsci was the first one to see it. That's why they found it in it. I just give you one example of the so many in history, but the example I study is that the Communist Party in Italy was founded in 1921 exactly because the, the Socialist Party, which Gramsci was part of a minute before, 
had basically not backed all the way the possible revolutionary breakthrough when the occupation of the factories actually happened in 1919. So of course, um, the left is the most divided, is weak, and that's horrible. And I would also like to say though that the Soviet Union, one of the big speaking points of why it's not possible to have any other society but capitalism is, oh, but look at what happened in the USSR, look at what happened, you know, in supposed alternatives. These, those were not alternatives. The USSR had a moment in which the revolution happens, in which the Soviet actually took over. That was a democratic moment. But that lasted very little because as soon as Lenin with the net had to say, okay, fine, but we are in a capitalist world order. I mean, we need to compete in an international capitalist market. All the democratic democracy uh, of, of that society fell apart. Uh, right, so that was not a real alternative. That was again, but the pressures again, speaking about the red, these are pressures that come from real economic forces from above, ab abroad, because you need to maintain competitiveness. How do you maintain competitiveness? Well, you have to repress wages to be more productive and to increase the surplus. And this is what the Soviet Union and China are doing just as the other capitalist economy, right? So it's important to realize that those were not, you know, those were not democratic alternatives. The democratic moment had a very short life, but I think one could really study how actually austerity took over in the Soviet Union as well uh, by 1925, 1926, really. And so how that molded society. Um, last point, uh, is it sustainable? That's a big question. Um, I think one insight Marx had, which is very important, is that, Agents under capitalism think independently, right? That's why he talks about the anarchy of the market. There's no collective plan, right? That's the difference between a flat economy and a market, but there's no plan. No one's thinking of the good of the whole. There's the rhetoric of the good of the whole, but clearly there's no good of the whole. And especially what's important is that what is good for the individual capitalist is probably in contradiction with the overall possibility of the system to preserve itself, right? So the typical example is exactly the one you gave, the fact that it's in the interest of the individual capitalist to repress wages. But if everyone represses wages um, and technological advancement is done in, in order, of course, to save on, on, on labor, et cetera, then you might not be able to realize your profit because no one will actually sell your commodities, right? This is a basic contradiction of a system that is not built on use value, but it is built on exchange value and on the driver profit, right? That it's not thinking about the subsistence of the whole. So these types of contradictions have been there since the very origins of the system. And I think they go through phases. And I think now we are in a very explosive moment um, and it, but again, I don't think there's anyone who cares uh, if the system really, you know what I mean? It's ultimately like it's the survival of the fittest and the fittest are on top ruling us and they will keep doing the policies that are in their benefit. So clearly now we're in a phase of um, we passed in a phase of financial capitalism, right? In which, uh, I don't know if you guys ever read Robert Brenner. Robert Brenner is an amazing scholar. He wrote a very important book called The Age of Global Turbulence, which explained why there was even such a thing as, as the welfare state in the, in the United States after the Second World War. Um, and he explains why it's all driven by the fact that you need to basically avoid the crisis of overproduction. And so you need to actually uh, develop Germany and the West of Europe, the Marshall Plan, which is all needed in order for commodities to even be purchased, right? So again, it's not because uh, people in power are nice. There's all these pressures from the top and then there's pressures from below. Of course, unions were strong and people were pushing from below. Um, but the point is that now again, we are in a moment that is very different because the system once more is not working on its own terms. So it, there's very little profitable venues and that's why ultimately it's all financial speculation. So uh, Robert Brenner now is speaking of this idea, and it's not just him, but the idea that we're kind of like in a new like feudal moment in which no new values produced, very little new values produced. What's happening is that the value that is already there is just being shifted more and more towards the few, right? And this you see very well when they give money to the banks to incentivize business uh, to the banks to corporations. Corporations just buy back their shares, mm -hmm. so they increase their value of their shares, but they're not actually producing anything. 
Um, so austerity in this moment of financial capitalism is even more important because uh, it's the system that has given up on basically real investment and unemployment. Um, how long is this sustainable? I don't know. I think we are in a moment, this is why I think we're in a moment in which we need to really fight, fight hard, because the contradictions are obvious to everyone. This is why this book is getting attention, because people are like, yeah, I mean, this is not just a crazy Marxist speaking, this is actually um, real, right? <laughs> Uh, it's it's real, and I think uh, we're in a moment in which we need mm -hmm. we need to make it such that that people mobilize more and more. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on to the next set of questions, we have a very relevant question from Zoom from Neil Coleman. Um, so they're saying there's a large campaign in South Africa for a universal basic income guarantee, which potentially has major implications for workers, unpaid reproductive labor, etc. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, of course, coming up uh, against austerity. Um, what is Clara's view on the campaign for a universal basic uh, income grant, given these contradictions? So on the one hand, the push for this type of social protection. On the other hand, austerity and the yeah. withdrawal of the state. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I think I think all struggles are important struggles, honestly. I'm of the idea that, you know, you can say, well, should we be skeptical about the universal basic income? Of course, it's something that Silicon Valley pushes for, again, on the idea that, you know, once you have unemployed everyone, then you're it's not a society that will uh, actually help you realize the profit. And you need consumers, you need uh, passive consumers. So, of course, there's a criticism about universal basic income, which is the fact that will it reduce us all to passive consumers while, while we could think about the idea of collective producers and being a value. Like, people do want to participate and, like, find meaning in their lives in jobs, though, that are not alienated, right? This is the problem, because the jobs that now we have available are alienating ex extremely exploitative uh, jobs. So um, um, clearly there's these, all these limits to the universal basic income to keep us skeptical about how it is ultimately within the limits of something that uh, the austerity capitalism could accept. But I also think, and this is why I say, I think all the good str all struggles are important struggles. Given that we are in a situation that is politically unstable, and given that the, my thesis is that the capital order is a political order, you see that any of these reforms could be politically devastating for the system. Why? Take an example. What happened during COVID? Uh, during COVID, what happened was that people got very little money, right? But they were exempt from going to work. Uh, people could actually um, could actually they got a small check from from exactly I don't know how it worked here but in the United States people got a very small check mm -hmm. to make their living okay so something that similar to like a very meager universal basic income if you like just because of the pandemic well this triggered the great resignation people actually said hey you know what then why should I go to work altogether what's the deal here right so that's what I'm saying is that uh, how, is the universal basic income going to like trigger a further threat because people then take this as a way to actually open up their political imagination and realize that then if you give us just a little bit of money, why can't you give us more money and why should we be wage workers uh, altogether? This can uh, bring forward uh, mobilization. So I do think these battles are all important battles so long as you one realizes that they're not the end point, but they're the beginning. Of, 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 of more radical changes, because I do think that we can only think about a society that is just if we do defeat the pillars of capitalism, wage relations and private property of the means of production. So, so long as the UBI fits in the possibility of actually building something more, then I think it's great. And I think that any struggle is good, but it's not going to solve the problems of capitalism. Yes, how, how the Silicon Valley would propose it. Yeah. Um, I hope I answered. Um, could, we, uh, could we please get hands again? Thanks, um, So let's start at the back uh, and we'll go one, two, three, four. Yeah, on. I just want to come, not only come to you, but you can do it on some school. 
Big business and industry who controls the means of production. We've got billions of billions of banks that they do not want to invest in, in infrastructure projects and capital expenditure projects to create sustainable jobs. They're not talking about the EPW jobs and what are we getting there in We don't want that. We want decent work, we want sustainable work. But we're also saying that we need to consider the environment. Mm -hmm. But they've also lost, I don't know how fair it is to ask you. What is the role? Because we always, I mean, when we now talk about no shedding and escom, we just hear corruption, corruption, corruption. Thank you. Now we know it's not just corruption. What is the role? I mean, how is austerity impacted, for mm -hmm. example, on the, 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 the challenges that is there that we are being confronted with, for example, by ESCOM? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that very interesting chat. I'm sorry, that talk. The question I want to ask you, have you looked at the role of the labor of care and reproduction 
in times of threat. I think that I'm going to say we always are in a state of therapy, but I am really interested in uh, the issue of the role of women yeah. during time, which is almost a permanent state of austerity. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Lindy, I think there was another comrade in the back row who had raised their hand. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, I want to start with this question. My name is Sunny. I have a few specific three questions. Uh, one is related to apprenticeship. To what was last to find to last speak on the first round in relation to the extent of which austerity they did. Which austerity, sorry? What's the last word? Oh, the extent to which austerity, where it's going to lead us. Where it's going to lead us, yeah. okay. Yeah. That was the question. Mine is to remind us of someone who said, no, channel uh, that. Capitalism gives its own grade. Yes. Now, we have already spoken about, or you have already spoken about, um, how it affects or it impacts on the population general, particularly uh, those who live under artificial conditions, the working class people today. But the part would be its impact on spiritual, on capitalism itself, yeah. in light of the fact that yeah. there is this uh, quote I have given someone in uh, the late 1890s, mm -hmm. that it gives its own grade. How does austerity contribute to mm -hmm. that ticket? Yeah. Uh, that's why the second one uh, relates to. Global area. Yeah. You have rules in the form of your United Nations that is controlled uh, by certain countries in the commerce. Yeah. You have institutions like your monetary, international monetary bar, mm -hmm. and many others. With those in place. I have, uh, I don't know if, uh, how we can get the book, uh, because uh, the risk we have is to ask questions that may not necessarily be in the book itself, but it would be great to mm -hmm. let you know as how we can get it. How would those institutions uh, be a standing block in fighting austerity? And I don't know how many times I thought I was going to uh, count the yeah, mentioned capitalism uh, without actually stating an alternative to it. Uh, I'm not going to ask other questions. I think those are enough. Mm. I'm sorry, but I didn't understand. The question is um, how the IMF and these institutions can how they bring about austerity or how they actually can fight against it? Because that's the question. The international institution that we monitor for, yeah. uh, some certain organs, like your security council, the United Nations, they say you can't. Yeah. Absolutely, they say you're the system. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's what I, I thought it was. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, these are very important. All really, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to be here with, with you. And this makes me, so happy because it's so important that you know there are spaces to discuss all these uh, daunting but so important problems. So let me I'll go in the reverse. So I'll start with you if, if it's okay. So that um um Kaplan it digs its own grave. Absolutely. So um it goes back to the question um, um of the 
Austerity for how long? Right? The last chapter is called Austerity Forever. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then, but then it also ends with the with the with the quote that is, I think, important. I would like to read it. Austerity is a political project arising out of the need to preserve capitalist class relations of domination. It is the outcome of collective action to foreclose any alternatives to capitalism. It can thus be subverted through collective counteraction. The study of its logic and purpose is a first step in that direction. So um, I think this is important is that in fact, this collective counteraction um, right now faces a moment in which the contradictions of the system are exploding. And um, what you are discussing ultimately, it's a dialectical process, right? So austerity, if we want to use a fancy word, but I think it does make sense to think about it. When the system is bad at delivering jobs and investment and growth, this is a moment in which austerity is ever more necessary um, in order to reap some profits out of this very system, yes? So the shift of resources from the many to the few that we've seen in, in the past uh, decades is I think even more um, violent and aggressive because uh, the system is not able to do what it was doing in some few countries in the 50s and 60s, which was actually preserve exploitation, but still be able to give higher wages because productivity was increasing, right? So if, if you're in a moment in which you can actually technologically advance, increase productivity. This allows greater space for higher wages because you are ultimately exploiting, it's what Marx called the relative surplus value, right? So you're exploiting, but in a way that is not directly about suppressing wages, you are exploiting by the fact that labor is just more productive. So if labor is more productive, you know, you can, you're making a lot of surplus, but your wages are, can, are is still compatible to have high wages. So my colleague, Anwar Sheikh has a very good graph. He has an important book called, it's a tough book, but it's a really good book because it tries to really give a different foundation to understanding our current economy uh, against the neoclassical foundation. It's called Capitalism, Conflict Competition, Conflict Crisis. Anwar Sheikh is an important uh, colleague of mine, just retired. And he shows a graph, right? In which you see how uh, in, in the United States uh, from the 50s to the 70s, productivity and wages were going hand in hand. And actually, so in this way, you could still maintain profitability, still giving higher wages. But then what happens is that once pro 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 productivity falls, you need to repress wages more and more, yes? So that's what I'm saying, that in certain historical moments, like the one that we're currently living, Austerity is even more needed because you got to repress wages in order to reap any profits from the system. But as you implement austerity more, this, of course, to solve the contradictions, of course, this will it, it, it increase the contradictions, right? So ultimately, that's why it's dialectical, right? In a way, because you're, you're, austerity is really a weapon in a moment of, a, of a, an economic crisis of the system. But then as you use it, this will ultimately exactly exacerbate this very crisis because in fact how long will it go until everyone has nothing anymore what how will the system preserve itself and that's again i think it's part of why we we can think imaginatively of an alternative system because this is not a system that has a, a general picture going back to what i was saying before so it tells us even more how we are in an irrational um, system in which few profit, but this this means that we we really can break through it. If that makes sense. Um, global arrangements, absolutely. So this is the thing. My book is focused on the West, right? So I look at internal class struggle in the hub of capitalism uh, in the 1920s. So of course, this is the case study I look at, and the reason why I look at this case study again is to show how austerity is comes out more obviously when it has to fight against alternatives, right? So this was very obvious in 1919. But I do think that, again, the time, this timeliness matters also today, because again, right now, we are in the, again in the wave of austerity also in the United States in a moment, again, in which we're fighting against um, alternatives. This said, of course, um, I would like to connect to the comments of the first uh, um, 
of, of, of the first speaker. She depicted a clear, um, she gave a really clear picture. Sorry, I got lost uh, with what I want to say. Um, yeah, she gave a really clear picture of how austerity was forever in, in South Africa. Uh, and in, the, and in, in general, that's the thesis that austerity is forever everywhere. Uh, it just becomes more visible in certain moments. So I agree with you, it has a much longer history than just that's the whole point. Um, but, and of course, the point is that uh, countries in the south of the globe, I think, need even a further investigation because, of course, the, the, the pressure from the, the, the global elite is an element of further reinforcement of the internal class struggle, right? So the internal class struggle has to be compounded with the intervention of the external class struggle, and that's why the IMF and all these institutions play a crucial role in, again, extracting resources. And again, what you, you said at the very beginning, it is the countries that are more resource rich that are ultimately the most underdeveloped and mm -hmm. a, 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 a exploited, right? And this is not by chance, again. It's, it's the political process that continues since the time of colonialism and has never stopped, right? Of just extracting resources away from the, the global south. So, so definitely, I think the, the story of these international institutions that are led, by the way, by Western economists who think with neoclassical models, which are the models that this book deconstructs, deconstructs in this in sense of showing how they're not neutral, but they're very political and they have a role to play. Um, these institutions have, play a massive uh, role in these countries as well. But again, a message to the, you know, to left-leaning comrades is let's though not reduce it to a, an issue of South Africa against you know the United States. It's much more complex because it's the the it, it class struggle happens at all levels, right? So it's the internal leaps of South Africa, which ultimately gain by being allied with the, the elites at the global level, right? So I think this is very important to keep the class dimension in the analysis also when we look at the international actors, if that makes sense. Um, but clearly the type of models that are being put in operation. And, you know, the head of the IMF right now just told us that they're expecting a recession. They're expecting one third of the world mm. to uh, be in a depression in the next, in a recession uh, in the next years. And they're expecting, I don't know how many, there's like 52 countries who are like in a serious debt crisis right now in the world, all from the global south. So they know all of this. And what is their solution to increase the interest rates? And what is increasing interest rates going to do? Well, of course, it's going to create a domino effect by which th these countries that are debt strats are going to be in further danger, right? So you see how, going back to your first point, how uh, th there's no will to preserve th the system from actually working. Their will is to constantly extract. And then how long will you pull this cord for? I don't know, until people freaking decide to revolt and rebel, but revolt all the way down, revolt all the way down, not trying to like fix it. You're not fixing this. This is, is rotten. This is a rotten system at a global level. You got to stop thinking, start thinking outside of the box, outside of, of the way we think. Um, and so I think that's very important about, um, about the role of care and women. Well, I mean, it's it's not my field of research. There's so much research on this. And what is clear, obviously, is that it's the weakest uh, that ultimately suffer the most and bear the greatest uh, burden of this type of society. So, uh, and um, the, the reason why it all has not collapsed completely is because there are uh, especially women who are uh, doing um, things that are unimaginable to even uh, keep their households alive and functional, right? So the, the way the state has dumped, um, you know, the state and the market go hand in hand in capitalism. So let's not be idealistic and saying if we are for the state, then we are for a, a society that is different. No, since the emergence, we know the state and the market go hand in hand, but part of what the state did, at least probably not in South Africa, but at least in the, the, the rich um, West, in some moments in history was that the state took on a lot of um, the, the, some of the burden that was first dumped on the woman, right? So the childcare, the education, the, the canteens were all kind of things the state took on, still not on the private capitalist, was the state, but at least it was taken off the shoulders 
uh, from, uh, from, from the household. Now we're in a situation in which it's all dumped on the household. Nothing is, done, nothing is dumped on the private sector, of course. Not even the risks, going back to the first question that was asked, not even the risk now, money is being made without any risk. Right, that's the thing. That the whole rhetoric that um, people who have a lot of money should have it because they risk more—that's bullshit. Because actually, the 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 the, all, the money that goes out goes out to bail out. The, there's no risk at all. Right. That's that's the other thing. Like the Schupenthalian idea by which the entrepreneur is actually being—you um, should you should give money to an entrepreneur because they're willing to risk. That doesn't hold anymore in our society. Um, so again, uh, I, I feel like right now we are in a moment in which the state has given up any <clears throat> support of, of, of the household labor, uh, so which means that austerity, of course, is something that women feel the most. Um, last point I wanted to make, you said great things, and it was really, uh, I think, um, all of the thesis of the book is, you know, there is money when uh, the state wants to use it there is money for the military there is money for uh you know giving it to great pharmaceutical companies for vaccines there is money for but there's no money for other stuff right so this you said uh quite clearly and this is exactly the logic of austerity uh which is again that you use the rhetoric of there is no that there is no way out and this is a necessary virtuous economic policy when it's all about transferring resources uh, just about corruption, I think one point that is important there is, um, again, how the IMF and all of these experts in power, the easiest thing is to blame local institutions for being corrupt, right? Again, a very individualistic framework. Oh, you know, it's and it's ultimately a really racist, by the way, out, outlook, which, but by the way, was already the, the outlook they had the Brits had against Italians. If you read the chapters I have on Italy, the reason why they're saying Italians deserved Mussolini and the dictatorship was that ultimately the elite in power was saying, the Italians don't know how to self-govern. They're ultimately ungovernable, don't know how to self-govern. When they govern themselves, they're corrupt. And ultimately then, good, we have a dictator who at least follows our dictats about what are the correct economic policies, right? So in this sense, and um, corruption is a pseudo racist and extremely individualistic um, rhetoric, which we really should. And again, what does it mean, corruption? Uh, my very good friend and comrade, Camila Vergara, who I think Tocco met, wrote this great book that I really advise called Systemic Corruption. And her whole point is to say we need to think about capitalist societies and political institutions as systemically corrupt. Um, the, the system is organized, the, the framework, even the constitutional framework, which is the constitutional framework of, the, of our economic system, which is, again, mirrors our economic system and, and boosts our economic system, is a system that is corrupt. Because what does corruption mean? It means that there's no liability between those at the top and those at the bottom, those in government have no liability whatsoever. And this is something that is not corruption. It's just institutional, the institutional framework of advanced capitalism. Again, look at the central banks. Central banks decide what to do with the most important thing in our society, which was where, how much, how, what is the value of money? They decide it. They decide what to do. The treasury officials decide what to do with money. They're not really elected. There's a bureaucracy that works that never gets really reelected. And plus, if we take seriously the election criticism of the fact that anyway, elections are a farce, mm -hmm. then we realize how the system is systemically corrupt everywhere, not just in the south of the globe, everywhere, and especially in the United States. I mean, the most obvious concrete example is the fact that people that get elected are people who have to raise billions of uh, millions of, of money for their campaign, right? Otherwise, you don't even stand a chance to be known as to be put on the on the ballot box if you don't have millions coming from corporations. I mean, the United States is the electoral process is most rigged. What is that? Just as an exception? No, that's the rule. That's systemic corruption. It's everywhere, right? So let's be critical about. It. And then, of course, uh, there's people who gain, but that's systemic, and then individuals gain from it. But it's a more systemic issue, and it comes with the type of society we're in. Um, okay, 
that's yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think what we'll do now is take just two more questions and we'll close off this first session and uh, comrades will find the lunch being served in the kitchen. You know, you can go outside, catch some fresh air, maybe sit here and eat, and we'll reconvene at half past 12, have a short 30 minute session with some concluding remarks, um, and then round off at uh, one o'clock. So, could I please just have two questions, two inputs? Oh, yes, you've been. That's <laughs> fine. So, we'll start with this come here, then we'll end with back there. Um, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so there's a two broad questions. Sorry, comrades, can we please give each other chances to speak? I promise I'll be super short in the answer. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, fantastic. Um, so a lot of your central thesis is that global elites and capital is intentional, pernicious, deliberate, and, and it's attempt to extract resources from the poor uh, to subject the system in the favor of the elites. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's an important contention, an important agitation. Uh, and so, we assume that when the economics is taught to us, it's very positive, it's not normative, it's value key, it's the faceless. You know, bureaucrat who has all the information. I'm saying this as a former bureaucrat, so a former treasury official. Uh, and so, but institutions are shaped by our values, right? So, this focus on individualism, Ayn Rand, you know, um, uh, in particular, and, and the Austrian school. Uh, and so, these institutions are, sh are, are shaped. And so, a person who's a Goldman Sachs banker is no less driven by, no more driven by avarice compared to the rest of us. Yeah. So, in the original Seven Deadly Sins, avarice. Was scorned upon and our avarice is celebrated the idea of greed accumulation uh and so it's it's normative that banks pursue profit that individuals pursue consumption and accumulation so is it still a case where it's deliberate attempt by Jan Yellen to understand the impacts of monetary or what you termed uh, uh, monetary uh, austerity or is it just the way it is and we're so blinded by the way the world works that we don't consider us actually harming each other, mm. harming the poor. So rich people sitting in, 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 in the financial center of Johannesburg or New York or London aren't necessarily evil individuals or any more evil than us, we're all just free mm. because of, of, of latter-day you know, erosion of value and that's just one. Because elites also compete with each other. They're not, they're not conspiring against the worker. They're easily greedy as in each other. So that's one. Second, and this is more of a technical, are there natural boundaries? Are there affordability thresholds? And are there counterfactuals? Uh, because one of the big criticism of MMT is that it assumes that everything can be funded. And maybe, maybe I'm constricted in my worldview, but I do believe there are natural boundaries and we can progressively realize things. Uh, and so with fiscal austerity, the counterfactual in South Africa for spending more on healthcare, policing, education, which are absolutely critical right now, is transferring all resources from the poor to bondholders who are really wealthy for the most part. So, so that, that's why I mean, I mean, I don't mean to state this as a binary, but that is the rational calculus for us to increase our spending on policing, healthcare, and education. When it comes to monetary austerity, the counterfactual kind of right now, given that we we um, are very sensitive to the exchange rate, is higher inflation, which erodes the value of social costs of, of poor people's sub, sub sufficient uh, income. And lastly, with regards to industrial austerity, what we're experiencing in our country right now is increased privatization of electricity and to some extent rail as well when it comes to freight. That's not a function of an ideological change in the ruling party's thinking. It's a function of the complete failure of the ANC to actually allow uh, state owned enterprises and public goods to actually provide it in a manner that is efficient, in a manner that takes care of, uh, that, that, is, that is delivered to the poor. And so it's not, it's not a bunch of um, right-wing ANC individuals, it's just the state has no capacity to keep the lights on all time. And public passenger rail has failed in this country. It's actually been looted. Uh, and so with those three, I mean, I'm sorry, this is, uh, on the technical part, I'd like to do both this also. Thanks again.
Actually, yeah, the, yeah. the first one, the counterfactual for the fiscal austerity, what was it? Was, was, was two parts. One is the portability thresholds, and two, the direct impact of that is then increasing our overall budget allocation. Uh, uh, to interest or to debt service costs, but also the direct impact in terms of inequality, because now you're taking resources, increasing taxation uh, on the poor, and the tax base is quite small, but the poor get taxed quite hard when it comes to consumption taxes, and you're trying to transferring it directly to bondholders, and we borrow at 8, 9, 10, 11 percent, well above our yeah, uh, nominal uh, uh, growth rate. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for this Pass it behind. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you for your presentation. I think mine will be short in, in terms of uh, the, uh, your uh, analysis of these trends and also help us in, uh, to deepen understanding around uh, what could be more challenges mm -hmm. um, on the basis that they, we have a development model you know, that uh, advances, you know, um, the um, model that uh, you, you take from you know the, the poor and also shift you know the resources to efficient users, meaning that which is a uh, creative condition for um, investment by capital, so to speak. And I'm not sure whether I'm using investment in a, a very cautious way. Uh, but then uh, you could uh, maybe elaborate more on the shifting of these resources. Um, then, uh, because now we are seeing, you know, the, um, the biggest what some call uh, land rush or some call land grabbing, meaning that uh, you know where you know that is based on on the on the on the idea or the logic that uh, the current users or the the right holders of those particular lands are not actually using you know, the land, you know, to up, optimize mm -hmm. or shifting the land from inefficient users to the developers. That's creating, you know, opportunities for economic development and also environment. So we are in a country that needs to replace some of the inequalities. But how does this plan actually it does not? Uh, like in a way that um, yeah. you know uh, that uh, tighten you know, or deepen the existing you know uh, the inequalities. So whether you your thesis have also looked into deepening that you know in your framing of the shifting of the resources you know um, from the poor yeah. to to uh, not really, yeah from the poor to the so-called uh, capitalist and efficient users. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, these are all really important points. So um, let me uh, try to give some thoughts to the question you just asked, and then we. Um, this is the problem. We really need to problematize every word that is given to us in the public debate, like efficient use. What does efficient? Let's try to figure out what efficiency means. And again, it's a term that derives from a theoretical framework that has completely eliminated class conflicts, right? So it's looking at the whole as if there's like efficiency, which will again be benefiting all, right? But actually, I think that's the first thing one should start doing uh, as an activist is every time they use these technical key terms that sound good, uh, ask them, okay, then how is how is this uh, um, giving these resources to the most efficient, um, actually more efficient? What does more efficient mean? That it's going to uh, uh, um, extract more surplus from this land? Uh, is that, uh, in first of all, you know, these, the point is that our economy is completely detached from the conservation of natural resources altogether. So that's also a really big problem that I think now is one of the biggest contradictions of our system today is that it's so clear that what is economically inefficient can be deeply problematic in, even from a point of view of uh, environmental sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. Because to be more efficient, potentially you have to, efficient in the sense of being like making that land more productive, you have to use certain um, fertilizers or certain technique 
of cultivations that are actually really damaging for the soil in the long run and are actually um, impoverishing the land. Is that a fit, you know, is that part, is that calculated when we use the term efficient? And this is just to consider the environmental issues. But then efficient means what? You're probably going to have to uh, reduce the wages of the people who work in your field in order to actually, you know, uh, invest in the technology. So you, if you want to like have more technological um, instruments available to cultivate this land, you'll probably need to like, the trade-off is that you will start repressing the wages so as to have the capital to invest in this technology and potentially in order to have prices that are competitive enough for exports, then you'll even more need to keep down wages. So this is the question. I think we need to rediscuss what this means to be efficiency. And the problem here is connected to a longer, like more macro problem. And this is where I would, I, I think my intervention can be valid or thought provoking <laughs> for all of you is that the solution really rests outside of the box. Um, and it's the reason why I agree with all of your counterfactuals, but this is exactly showing you how the spectrum of possibilities within capitalism are extremely limited and tight. Because it's again, it's a system that is not at its core, it's not a system that is meant to produce goods for the use of people, to satisfy people's needs. That's not the engine of our system. It's a system meant to accumulate more money with respect to money you started off with, which is structurally detached from what you're actually producing, what you're actually doing, right? I always give my students this example. If Elon Musk finds out that it's more profitable to make trash bags rather than Tesla's, he'll just switch his investment to trash. And then this is actually like how, if you look at economists, classically called political economists, the people in my department, they look at, for example, the equalization of the profit rate. Why is that you can, this is because capital is detached from what it's actually doing, and it's just moving where it's more profitable, and that's considered efficient. Uh, so once more, you know, uh, these are all real limits. So that's why, connecting to your question, the point here of this book is not to say there's a huge conspiracy against the people. It's not an in, it's not an intentional conspiracy of uh, in like you know what even the idea of conspiracy is annoying to me because it's a typical idea that anything that is thinks a little bit outside the box should be looked at with um, suspicion. Like anything that is mildly critical, are you then are you just a conspirationist? It's like, no, like I'm just trying to figure out the logic of how the system logically works. It's not the opposite of what I want to say here is that there's evil people trying to rule the world against it. that's just like that's not and that's what Typical conspiracy theory is, which they can get crazy, of course, but they think that the Nazis are still like have an <laughs> underground. I was looking at this video, I was like, oh my gosh. So they, <laughs> there's like an, an underground city and like some stuff like uh, the, the Antarctic guy, which is, I don't know. What so anyway, but the point here is to also there, like be wary of people when you're critical. Oh, do you, this is this just some conspiracy theory? No, it's actually trying to figure out what is the logic of the economic system we live under with the idea that this system, there's no determinism here. And this is a problem with um, the quote of Marx uh, of the capitalism digging its own grave, right? producing its own grave diggers, is that we don't want to read that in a deterministic way. That's very problematic. The system is not going to collapse on its own because the system is created by us. It's the product of collective social political action. And that's how it can only get dismantled is like, through agency, through taking charge, to participating, to risking one's livelihood and like believing in it, right? And this has happened historically. Like we know it in this country, particularly, we know how much people like fought for changes that then were not though all the way down, you know? I mean, Mandela never repudiated capitalism, quite to the opposite. They, they, he tried to like look good in the face of the international economic system, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's 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 a problem. Um, what, what why was I saying this? Just to conclude, is that uh, to get to your points, I think your your counterfactuals are very important, and I think there's limited degrees of uh, of alternatives to austerity <laughs> within capitalism. There are some. Um, for example, price caps have been used uh, to cure inflation. Now we are all convinced that the only way to cure inflation is to increase the interest rates. But historically, that's why history is important. Mm -hmm. If you look at historically within capitalism, and most capitalist countries of all the United States, they didn't 
major price controls uh, on basic goods, right? They put controls on fuel, they put controls on, on bread. Um, and this was within the limit of the system somehow. But of course, where is the boundary of that limit? How much is then does this become too political? And ultimately, we're not in a system in which the uh, impersonal rules of the market reign anymore, because we enter in a fact that, okay, then prices are a political decision. This, you know, has us all click. Well, if prices are a political decision, right? Because they ultimately are, by the way, because it's the private capitalists who decide the prices. Now we think it's all a technical thing, but actually like they decide the price to put on the goods, right? Now the models tell us they, they, it's an automatic thing. This is my colleague uh, Richard Wolf is very good on this. He has an, um, a, a program every week called the Economic Update, and he's very he's, he talks about like basic how the economy works. He's very good, and he just says like we're all convinced that inflation is just like this. You know, the prices just rise and fall kind of according to some like hand waving or. Of course, there's like market forces, but they're ultimately decisions of the various corporations that run certain, that produce certain commodities, right? So it's already a political decision, but it becomes even more political if the state takes on. So that's the thing, like there's margins within our system, but they're, they can shift immediately to something more and trigger further changes, which is something that um, people in power are very wary of. So it's, I don't think it, we need conspiracy to just really just read what economists are telling us, someone like Janet Yellen, she just says very clearly, we need unemployment to be up at a certain level if we want to guarantee wages to be down. This is a fact of the matter. So she's very like, so, and that's the thing, is she greedy? She's probably greedy and certainly our society uh, uh, boosts greediness, but greediness is not something that is a universal anthropological trait of human beings and secondly of uh, second of all uh, the power of ideology is real that's the last thing i want to say i mean uh, she deeply believes that it's only through wage repression that we can get more efficient and we can get more competitive and ultimately that our economy can function again if you're convinced that the only way out is capitalism well these are the rules of the game so the ones who apply them best will ultimately be able to maintain, preserve uh, a smooth economic growth. So she's not wrong. She's much more Marxist than a lot of Keynesians. She understands that these are the rules of the game. And then there's a very little space. Jiggle room is very limited. So I really do urge us to really think deeper in how right now, what are alternatives gaining back the local dimension repudiating the idea that we need to depend on other countries for imports and like going back to the local, the land is ours. I mean, taking back real connection with the earth and producing and distribution goods. These are like the first things that are quite obvious ultimately and have been the truth for uh, our society uh, for many years before capitalism. Mm -hmm. Good, I would say that I-, mean, I Yeah, wait. no, that was, that was been very good. I exhausted myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thanks, yeah.